washing our hands Off into our elbows These are the things, the things we know, we know If people want to wear a mask, that is okay These are the things, the things we know That prevents you from speaking moistly Speaking moistly going on guys it is i mike the bird man donna that's not how i normally start the show off i just felt like being a little bit more musical this week as i enjoy a week i don't even know what it is in quarantine and yes of course i'm here in the bird cage here in guelph ontario canada but i am sadly alone but not alone in the virtual world we are not connecting via zoom which is evidently hackable and susceptible to porn attacks we are joined via discord by my co-host Alex, the producer, did you say porn attacks? Yeah, it's weird. People porn bomb people that are using Zoom for virtual like nice. conferences and everything. So they'll just randomly Skype in, for lack of a better description, and they'll just put porn on while they're having like a See, family meeting. Now I'm like, cool. And then I'm like, it would probably be a whole lot of tub girl. So <laughs> it, it's going to be a lot of disturbing shit. Uh, it, it also exposes some windows vulnerabilities as well. So, well, I mean, yeah, it, it's software that uh, until recently wasn't really necessary. Uh, I know for a fact that Google, because of zoom doing all this, Google is really amping up their hangouts code. And you should probably see that in the next couple of weeks, come out with a, a fully more robust system. Uh, as well as a few other companies are doing it. But, you know, that was always when people like, why don't you use Hangouts? It's like, well, it doesn't do as much as Zoom. That's going to change. Yeah. Um, I mean, we ourselves, we use uh, Discord here at, on, on Twig just because it's honestly a fantastically robust interface for us. Plus, all the bots you can add in is a lot of fun. So, Oh, and there's, um, there's crazy stuff that we don't even take advantage of. There are ones that you can record video podcasts through it, too. And it's like, it's just aren't not our bag. We're an audio podcast. Yeah, exactly. I was actually talking with um, a friend of mine this week. He was asking why, if I did a podcast, would you prefer audio or video? I'm like, audio because it's easier to listen to. It's very akin to talk radio, which is something I've always been a big uh, fan of. And video podcasts, at least in my opinion, um, unless you have a really good production with good lighting, good camera setup, and good chemistry between the hosts. I mean, unless you're in the right location like with each if, other. If you're getting, well, here's the thing. If you're making millions of, off of it, like Joe Rogan, then you can yeah. afford to do it uh, that way. Or as, like as Kevin a Smith's video podcast. Yeah, when you're running it like, you know, as a traditional uh, talk radio studio and you got the money to do that, go right ahead. But if you're in your own place, it can it can be off, you know, off-putting. The last time that I remember like video podcasts being a big thing was back in the like the video iPod era when you had what was it like Hack Five and you had I uh, actually uh, Game Heroes Vision Three and Hack Five yeah Game Heroes stuff like that um and yeah you're right Un unless you've got the money to put behind these things I mean there are internet shows that are treated like video podcasts like um one channel I'm a big fan of is 
internet today. I like how I consider them like a video podcast uh, or they just have different channels or different shows for their different types of topics. They're really, really well produced and it's just them in front of a camera and occasionally they'll cut to footage. That's okay. But video podcasts, not everybody is also on camera presentable and that's not a knock against anybody's appearance or you know appearance shaming. Some, but some people can be fugly <laughs> well as one of my radio professors put it some people have a face for radio some people have a naturally pleasant speaking voice and you know sometimes they're you just not appealing is. to the eye and it's not just that it's the lighting it's always off-putting if if people don't have the same lighting if, you know one yeah, person's like darker for, one, one person has daylight one person has fluorescent one ha- it just it comes across as amateur hour yeah like you really have to know what you're doing when you're doing video um it's it is an art form and it's a very technical art form with audio you can get away with less but with video your video can look great but if it sounds like shit no one's gonna watch it but with audio you know if your audio sounds like shit the setup, kind of. well, here's the thing. The setup you need uh, for an, a good audio podcast is you need a $25 dynamic mic, one that'll pick up your voice clearly with a good range and doesn't necessarily pick up a lot of background uh, noise. People always make the mistake of buying a high-end condenser mic and then they don't have the proper sound isolation in their room to use it. Uh, and then you just literally need either a USB audio interface or an XLR to USB interface, which is what I use. You can have a decent sounding uh, audio setup for about 40 bucks. Video, minimum $150 if you're getting a high end webcam. Then you need lights. Then you need, like, you're looking at a three or $400 setup minimum. And that's just to look okay. And yeah. then there's all the variables around you you have to deal with. If like you wear a key or anything yeah, like that, if you wear glasses, guess what? You can't wear glasses. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to have to have proper uh, light reflectors and everything. Otherwise, it looks like crap. So yep. if you're, it's just not worth it if you're wearing glasses. If you don't have a background in it, and, and you'll if you watch any you know YouTubers and or you watch a lot of uh, Twitch streamers, they a lot of times they'll have to get like prescription sunglasses or they'll have to get ones that they'll have to get filters for their cameras to specifically remove glare and reflections. So. One of the things that I've been doing with my week, as you all can imagine, and if you've been following my like my social media, I'm still consumed by the all loving, all knowing, all new to me Persona Five Royal. I am 124 hours in, according to Alex. I am nearing the end of my uh, playthrough. Um, I'm living with every mistake that I've made. So. I save at every point I can just in case I do fuck up. But if I do make a mistake, I live with it. And I have, I'm pretty sure I've chosen the path of abstinence in this playthrough um, because I was not looking at a prompt when I should have, you know how it always says I should choose my next words carefully. Evidently I was petting the cat and wasn't looking at what I said. And I just went, yeah, 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 sure. Whatever. So I screwed myself out of one of the many relationships in that game. <sighs> Sadness. But it's it's amazing how much this game has honestly impressed the hell out of me compared to its vanilla release. I, I've had more than a few people ask me on uh, on the socials if it's worth picking up over the original. And I would absolutely say 100%. Like Alex gave a pretty glowing review uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm inclined to agree with him right now. I also like how they took out some of the more annoying puzzles later in the game and they've reworked some of the existing ones. So they're less irritating than they were before. Um, I'm looking at you. Mice one has been reworked and one in the depths of mementos has been reworked. So I was less pissy. Um, I still required Blair's help for one of them just because she has better pattern recognition than me. Um, but it's been a pretty pretty good experience with it. So um, me and Alex will have our, our roundtable discussion about that probably in about a week or so. We're, we're also going to talk about Final Fantasy VII because uh, I'm going to get a chance to play that this week. God help me. Um, 
and I will <laughs> obviously, and then I will finally get into my Resident Evil Three. Um, which weird side note. So I found this out, and it's been theorized that it's due to a licensing issue. So you guys all know I'm a huge fan of G Fuel. G Fuel has a Resident Evil nemesis tea flavor which is basically their version of an an arnold palmer which is my favorite iced tea of all time however you can only buy it and ship it to united states addresses that genuinely surprised me um i guess capcom could only secure the licensing there's a possible one of two possibilities or maybe both uh one uh they may not have paid to license it for Canadian distribution based on uh, the actual Capcom license. Or two, there's an ingredient in there that's not approved in Canada. It's possible, yeah. I mean, G Fuel comes it, it in happened. the can. The, the, anything you import into Canada has to go through like our equivalent of the FDA for approval. We yeah. also have much stricter, <laughs> it's not guidelines, we have much stricter rules that you have to follow. You can basically eat whatever crap you want in the States. Uh, and, and that stuff would get you, you know, banned up here because we have, we're, we're actually probably stricter than even most parts of Europe. Some parts of the, of the European union have pretty strict rules too, but uh, it also can be a case of in Canada, you are required by law to list every ingredient you have in the States. They can say that some things can be kept secret due to uh, patents or, you know, they, they basically have uh, ownership of that product and they don't want their secret recipe getting out sort of thing. But up mm. here, that doesn't fly. You have to release all your ingredients. So my guess is there's an ingredient on there. It's not on a banned list, but it might be a, something that isn't allowed to be sold in that quantity up here. Yeah. I mean, regardless, I got mine. Thanks oh, to Jen. Oh, I was going to say, you'll get it. <laughs> you just yeah, exactly. I'm getting like, it because it's Arnold nothing... Palmer and nothing will stop me. It's, it's just a case of one of those... You know, just because a big corporation isn't allowed to openly sell it on the open market up here, it doesn't mean that a friend can't get it for you as a gift. Yeah, exactly. So I'm looking forward to trying that. So thanks, Jen, for looking out for me. I know I can always count on you. Um, other than that, um, actually, this is kind of a fun story. So I did um, another Reddit exchange. And um, I've met some wonderful people on there. I actually met a girl... Uh, who helped me with my uh, Harry Potter um, themed uh, anniversary gift to Blair. Uh, she made us a really cool cross stitch, but I made another friend on there through this most recent gift exchange, which is pretty cool. I got her dog, some like dog toys. Um, so that was really cute. They're adorable. Like I think they're boxers. I think they are. Um, and she's pretty neat too. Um, but I got one of my Reddit gifts yesterday. And this was for cult movies. So I made it a point to fill out this extensive uh, list of things you like for the exchange preference. Because last time under the Star Trek exchange, they gave me the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man because they didn't want to do their research on me. I was like, okay, fine. So I decided to do overkill this time. And it paid off. Uh, someone sent me the Die Hard Nakatomi Heist board game. Um, where it's two to four players. One person plays as John McClane, or the other person plays as Hans Gruber and his gang of crooks. Now, you either have to stop the crooks from stealing the money, or you have to defeat John McClane and get away with uh, the money. Um, and it looks kind of cool, actually. I've, I've read some of the reviews for it. I've seen people play it on YouTube before. So I'm really surprised that someone went out and got this for me, and it's gift one of two. So I don't know what, what the other gift is. Ooh, neat. Yeah, I was surprised because this is like 50 bucks. I was like, holy shit. Um, and they wrote to me, Merry Quarantine. May you and your friends find this fun while you're enjoying this dystopian landscape or something along those lines. So big thanks to my Reddit se uh, Secret Santa. So I'm looking forward to playing that with Blair and maybe uh, my roommate when she decides to emerge from her like, hobbit hole um other than that uh, i guess let's uh talk about your week and what you've been doing in quarantine uh what's been going on uh earlier in the week i cleared out uh every review that i had on going because i had a feeling uh <laughs> i was going to be 
more than just a little busy playing Final Fantasy VII. Um, you know, full disclosure, we did not get copies for review this time because demand is so high for that title as it's literally the biggest title until Cyberpunk. <laughs> um, but I uh, I played a little bit of uh, Trails of Cold Steel 3 to get myself in my RPG mood earlier. And then Midnight rolls around and I'm like, screw it. I'm not waiting for a physical copy. I pre-ordered the last second digital copy of uh, the digital deluxe edition that comes with uh, the Summon Materia bonus DLC for Final Fantasy VII. Uh, here's a tip. Don't bother with the digital deluxe edition because those three materia are useless. I thought um, so. Uh, they, you use them. They're gimmicky. And the very first summon you get in the game is ten times more powerful. So <laughs> there's literally no point. Uh, the digital soundtrack uh, lets you play music in an app on the system. Won't let you copy anything to a USB stick. Whereas... Uh, the uh, I think it was the Dragon Age one and the Detroit Become Human digital uh, download edition let you copy MP3s to a USB stick and play them anywhere you wanted when you got that for PlayStation. So there's no point in having a mini CD soundtrack when you can't use it anywhere. <laughs> um, and the uh, digital art book is useless as well. So, <laughs> so if you get them physical, cool. But there's no reason for the digital deluxe edition to exist. That being said, it came with some pretty cool themes, so I'm okay with it. I'm okay paying that. Um, uh, because I pre-ordered it on PlayStation Network, there's no tax using PayPal. So it worked out to be like 15 bucks more than getting it uh, retail, physical, standard edition. So I'm like, okay, it's not a big deal. Now, you asked what I've been doing. I did that. That's what I did. I did, I did Final Fantasy. I beat Final Fantasy in two days. <laughs> <laughs> so I started at midnight, stayed up for 29 hours. Oh my God. Now keep this in mind. I was up longer than that because I woke up at 11 in the morning on Thursday and I didn't go to bed, I think until 6 a.m. Saturday. Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> and then uh, I played more and beat the game at 6 a.m. this morning as a recording which is sunday wow um, you are a machine so i slept basically five hours and six or six hours and three days and put 40 ish hours on the system well <laughs> uh is good is <laughs> very good uh, i beat it and uh, see I, I look at this and i'm like and i beat it and remember how i was i was like i've complained about people putting out reviews for games when they haven't completed the game well I, I beat it now. I look at the trophies and the trophy for completing the game, less than 2% of people have done it. So that means of all the people playing it, that's that's one thing. There should be more reviewers that had it completed. <laughs> well, I, I know review copies went out at the middle of last week or the week before last. So review copies have been out for about a week and a half. And they still, So more people should not, beat it. Exactly. I'm, I, that number on average when a lot of reviewers beat it and then you know, let's say I beat it very quickly early on in, in its uh, release day cycle. There, that number should be at this point, if pe they've had it for two weeks for reviewers, it should be at about 5%, 5 to 10%, not 2%. So that means a lot of the reviewers didn't complete the game again. <laughs> so it's it, you have no excuse, people. You're working from home. So, yeah, there's nothing going on. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not like you're going anywhere for Easter. If you are, you're basically putting everybody at risk. <laughs> so, yeah, you're a terrible, terrible so, person. Uh, this this uh, week has been uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake or How Alex Spent His Easter Vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been fully immersed in the game. Uh, I will give anybody a tip right now for how the best way to play it is. Yes, it supports HDR. If you have an HDR TV, a really high-end one, you might want to leave it on. Probably not. This game pushes the PlayStation 4 to its max. Uh, the best way to play it, where you have literally no slowdowns uh, and you have like no graphical pop-in and you have just super buttery smooth gameplay, is make sure your TV is set to game mode it's for uh, you know input latency. Uh, make sure if you have a PlayStation 4 Pro, even if you have and you have a 4K TV, set your TV 
in your manual settings to HDMI 1.4 instead of 2. That will force it to play the game in 1080p, but you can actually make the uh, you can make your PlayStation 4 if you're set in that mode uh, super sample it so it renders the game at higher resolution than 1080p, but then basically it's like playing an anti-alias. So you, you're getting a full 1080p picture with slightly higher sample uh, graphics and just buttery smooth 60 frames per second the whole way through. So I, I fiddled around with the settings, and that's what I found works best. And it also doesn't make my system sound like it wants to explode like Kingdom Hearts did. It's a very optimized game. I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into it uh, this, this week. This is going to—it's it's 86 gigs, <laughs> which is probably the largest single-player game on ever. <laughs> Like, if you look at any game that's hit 100 gigs or more, it's been through multiple DLCs, or it's uh, from having, like, large multiplayer game aspects, like uh, the Halo, like, like Halo Collection is, like, over 100 gigs. That's four games. Uh, or you look at uh, uh, Call of Duty. Half of that, like, it's 120 gigs or whatever, half of that is the multiplayer. So this might be the largest single-player game ever. Not in length of how many hours it takes to beat. It's about 40 hours. But largest as in like just the amount of data that's on there. I can't imagine how good this is going to look and play when they port it over to PlayStation five. Yeah, that that's going to be something to see for sure. Um, so yeah, that's how you spent your Easter vacations. There's a little bit of a tech tip for you people that are looking into getting final fantasy seven remake. So coming up on this show, we have uh, quite the less COVID news than normal, which is kind of nice. Um, still got to talk about that, though, as we often always do here on the show. But we also have the weird news from around the world this week. We also have some reviews. I have a Harry Potter review. I actually got a copy of the Audible book from audible.ca. I'll be taking a look at the Tales of Beetle the Bard. Uh, read by an all-star cast, including Luna Lovegood, uh, Professor Fitwick, and Albus Dumbledore himself. Um, that'll be kind of neat to talk about. Uh, Alex, what reviews do we have from you? Oh, on the spot here. I have two reviews. Uh, we've got two from La La Land Records. Remember how we had the big box of, uh, of movie, like movie and, and TV scores come? Uh, there is one for the collector's 15 CD box set of basically every piece of music that was in the original Star Trek uh, series from the 60s. I've got a review of that in there. There's also one for Die Hard's 30th anniversary score. Ooh, very cool. So we will be taking a look at that and more all here on Twig. I've been Mike the Birdman Dodd. He's been Alex the producer. We'll be back, guys, right after my review of Tales of Beetle the Bard from audible.ca. Hey guys, Mike the Birdman Dodd here, and we are talking about yet another audible.ca audiobook release, and we are going to be looking at The Tales of Beetle the Bard, which is written by J.K. Rowling, and this is an audio production that has a really awesome all-star cast included in it. We also have Jude Law reprising his role as Albus Dumbledore in the Fantastic Beast film series, reading the notes that he includes at the end of every story. Warwick Davis, who plays Professor Flitwick, uh, who also played in the Star Wars movies. He reads The Wizard and the Hopping Pot. Um, we also have the woman who played Hermione in the original West End and Broadway runs of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child reading the tale of the three brothers jason isaac who played lucius malfoy uh reading the war warlocks harry hart ivana lynch who played luna lovegood one of my favorite characters and fellow ravenclaw i like to point out uh the fountain of fair fortune bonnie wright who played Ginny weasley she reads babbity rabbity and her cackling stump and then we also have uh sally montemore who plays madame pince or Pence, I think it is, uh, reading J.K. Rowling's introduction. So this is about an hour and a half, give or take, of these stories, and they also have sound effects, and they're, like they're produced like a drama, not unlike the Assassin's Creed Gold we took back um, a few weeks ago, um, and it retails for about twenty bucks Canadian. So the price is a little steep for an hour and a half of entertainment, but no different than buying a movie more or less and i think it's really neat just to have this extra bit of lore from the harry potter universe because this was originally written back in the early 
um, to mid 2000s, and there were only a couple of copies, and then it didn't come into mass circulation till later. However, um, I think most of the profits for this go to her charity, which eventually helps like orphans. I think it is. Um, it's kind of cool. Uh, one of the uh, quotes for this particular release says, we are delighted to bring fan favorite performers from across the wizarding world together for this unforgettable listening experience said uh, Diana DeFito. She's the SVP of uh, content at audible making the tales of beetle, the bard available to members continues audible's ongoing efforts to deliver accessible, engaging and immersive audio entertainment to millions of people around the world. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, when this was first published in 2008, uh, it was sold in aid of J.K. Rowling's children's charity, Lumos, which is the spell which lights up rooms and whatnot. So um, can I recommend this? If you're a Harry Potter fan and you're looking for a unique piece of audio content, yes, I really think it's neat. Because one of the things I found out from listening to Dumbledore's notes is the difference between a, a wizard who can transform into an animal, which is an animagus. So like how um, Professor McGonagall can turn into a tabby cat. That's a trait that's relatively rare. Like just some wizards can do it. Um, whereas if a wizard transfigures you, let's say when you get, when Malfoy got turned into a ferret, he was for all intents and purposes, a ferret. What do I mean by that? It means he has no capability of thinking or realizing he or she, or in this case, a he is a wizard, he just knows he is a ferret. So it would require someone to turn him back, whereas an animagus can still re retain and, and has all their thoughts of magic, and they can transform back while they can't produce human speech. Although, it would be interesting if a, if a creature, for example, if their animagus form was, say, a parrot, which can produce human vocal ranges, could they somehow get around this if they could hold their wand in their beak? But maybe that's me looking a little too far into breaking the rules of the wizarding world. But that being said, there's also um, just really good commentary. They also talk about uh, the hopping pot, how it was told to children, how you should always be willing to help others, but how eventually how the story was twisted over time, how muggles are all evil, and this shows wizard superiority and whatnot the warlocks uh, Harry Hart tells the tale of a guy who ripped out his own heart and has been often attributed to what a horcrux uh, is which if you don't know what a horcrux is you probably should stop listening um, but still it's really neat just to see all these little bits of the lore kind of filled in even though it is told as children's fairy tales but overall I really did like it I think the price is a little bit steep but if you're a new Audible member, well, there you go. So anyway, that's going to do it for this uh, review. So once again, if you want to check out this, you can find out the Tales of Beetle the Bard on audible.ca. News on the mark! Welcome back to This Week in Geek. I am still Mike the Birdman Dodd. He's still Alex the Producer. Let's talk about some of the things that happened around the world this week that are being put into new stands that are likely just kind of sit there for a few days because we're all socially isolating and not leaving the goddamn house. But that's why we're here. We're here to en entertain you as you enjoy isolation week 39 at this point, which I almost should be keeping track at this point. I feel like I should be scratching something on a wall. Anyway... Anyway, speaking of things involving quarantine, Nintendo is promising the Switch shortage will end soon. So according to Gizmodo.com, if you're like a lot of folks who are considering buying a Nintendo Switch to help pass the time while quarantined, you probably noticed that Nintendo's incredibly popular console has been pretty much sold out across the country for the past couple of weeks. Uh, currently, if you look at some of the major online retailers like Amazon, Walmart, and GameStop, there is almost no available stock for the Nintendo Switch. If you do find a new Switch for sale, chances are it's listed by a third-party seller that has jacked up the price to well above the Switch's regular $300 retail price, or in Canada, $399. And while things are less dire for the Switch Lite, uh, the version that can't hook up to your TV, supply for the cheaper handheld-only Switch has, has begun to dry up too. However, based on a tweet posted by Nintendo's official account stating that people who reserved the Switch could expect their consoles to arrive next week. There may be some relief to the Switch's depleted supply on the way. 
Furthermore, a representative for Nintendo US told GameIndustry.biz that more systems are on the way. We apologize for any inconvenience. To make things more difficult for hopeful Switch buyers, Animal Crossing New Horizons, which came out on March 20th, has been smashing sales records with more than 2.6 million copies sold in less than two weeks. And that's only in Japan. Combined with the current quarantine already straining supplies on everything from toilet paper from pantry staples, finding somewhere to buy video game consoles, including the Switch, Xbox One, and PS4, has become a lot more challenging. Um, Gizmodo has reached out to Nintendo for further info regarding retail supply. We'll update if they hear back. As of this recording, they haven't heard anything. Um, I actually have a story to tie into this. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, just as quarantine was starting to hit, I decided, okay, I kind of want to play the new animal crossing. There's a few other games I want to play. Like there's that new vampire, the masquerade, uh, game that came out. So I bought that for like 20 bucks and I started playing my like switch a a lot more, but I noticed my battery was draining within minutes and I'm just like, Oh fuck. Um, and Alex has basically told me I did dumb. With my console, I kept letting it drain. It sat underpowered or unused for months. And basically, I fucked up the battery. Um, It's it's actually designed to be plugged in all the time charging. So what happened was you let it... It's one thing to let it drain now and then. The problem is you let it drain to zero probably 90% of the time. Yeah, so there's a... Pro tip, kids, keep your switches charged. Um, you don't have to be playing them all the time, but keep keep them charged. Um, I'm a little worried about my Nintendo 3DS, but that's a system that's meant to be drained. Yeah, um, that one, the, the, the 3DS and the, especially the 2DS, um, or not 2DS, yeah, the, the original DS Lite, those can be unplugged for like months and still be working. <laughs> so uh, it, it wasn't a problem there, but the Switch is designed to be always in its dock. Mm-hmm. Um, so another thing, so when that happened to me, I'm like, okay, fuck. Well, I may need to start looking for another switch. So I decided to round up all the games I had in my house and take, take Blair down the GameStop. Well, that was the day the executive order came down from the premier of her province. Not essential businesses were to close. So that avenue was closed off to me. But GameStop slash EB Games in Canada wasn't accepting trade-ins, yet they were still allowing you to buy copies of Doom Doom Eternal and Animal Crossing. Okay, fine. I get that for self safety and health reasons. I get that. Cool. Whatever. I'll figure it out. But I decided to just kind of keep an eye out because I've been able to squirrel away enough money over the last few months that if I needed something, I could get something. I had something broke. And I've been looking online and people are assholes like they are people scalping there's one dude that i know personally he is scalping a nintendo switch animal crossing edition how much do you think he's asking for it well i, I can say i don't the, that's the special uh dock and everything right yes i'll say this i know a local guy who runs a store that had i think it was three or four of the switch lights which again it's not ideal for everybody uh, but what he was asking was 400 bucks for brand new Switch lights uh, with two games. Uh, and, you, and you could get a uh, used copy of Animal Crossing. You could get a used copy of Smash Brothers. <coughs> and a pretty big variety. And that's not bad. And that also included delivery to your home. Like the guy would like get in his truck and drive it over sort of thing. So it was a pre-order retail for 3 dollars Is the guy asking 600 bucks? 800 that you should Scumbag. be you should be stabbed for that yeah like i was like dude you gotta be kidding me i mean there were other people less a little less scumbaggy but they were looking to make five six but you got a bunch of games with it and that's okay ish but still not cool um so hopefully nintendo supply shortage will come to an abrupt end and more people will be able to readily get these at non-insane retail prices but there are people who are sitting there on ebay and facebook who will go out and buy four or five of these consoles and they they can easily expect to get five hundred dollars for them well they can I ask it. Hope they, they can ask I, it. I, I, some I of them they get stuck with them yeah i was gonna say sometimes you'll get stuck with them uh there will be somebody you know where i feel bad is for somebody who's like 
My kids are home forever. We've been promising that we're going to get a Switch for the last year or two. We finally saved up enough money, and their birthday's coming, and now we can't afford it. Yeah, like, I don't know. I mean, when society shows its cracks, the worst in humanity tends to show up. And it's it's unfortunate that people are taking advantage of this, of this situation, but I kind of hope it ends you know up what? like the Costco I thing. Kinda, I kind of hope you just name the person that's scalping right here. No, because I don't want to be liable. Um, is, is okay. I don't ever, don't reveal who it is, but is this person somebody that you didn't expect to do that? No, actually, this is a person I know. When when they have something that's geeky and collectible, and they're local, they will well oversell it. Not just suggested retail; they'll market about thirty percent above eBay average. And the reasoning behind it. Because they have it and you don't, and they know it. So this is obviously somebody who doesn't actually know how supply and demand really works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that you can like you can't price out your customers. <laughs> yeah, like this guy, I saw him sell a fairly a fairly well wanted collectible last year from I think it was like Fan Expo, um, and he was asking one and a half times to two times the price. And I don't know whether he ever got it. Probably not, but probably at, at the same time. Um, and I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. Although to this guy's credit recently, he did have something for sale that he wasn't asking something like an insane markup. He had a transformer from Walmart, which the transformer Walmart reissue. Sometimes they're really easy to find. Sometimes they're really not. Um, and he had a reissue and he only wanted 50 bucks. I'm thinking, you know what? That's a reasonable cost. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is it's toys. People aren't they probably realize toys aren't people aren't buying them right now. People are buying. Uh, things. They're, they're buying them, but they're I just not. got an offer on my night Raven. So no, you, you got the, that's that you got those aspects and you got certain really dedicated collectors that'll want something. But right now, electronics, things where you can use it to consume your time is what is, <laughs> is selling. I'm noticing a lot of people in a lot of the buy and sell groups that I'm a part of, because I don't think you're a part of very many buy and sell groups. Um, I'm, I'm a part of uh, KW. I think I'm in the Guelph one. Uh, and that's about it. I hang in a lot of higher end ones and I'm not calling like I'm a better person than you know, like no, I hang in pe- people like, that are the crazy prop replicas. Yeah. Yeah. Like I hang in prop replicas, toys, certain toy lines. And I notice a lot of people are selling their things because they need money because of the, the pandemic and people who I guess are more well off or have stuff squirreled away are taking advantage of it, which isn't, a, I can't, I can't even call it a scumbag move because they have the money. The person has the toys. They can make the transaction however they see fit. It's just taking advantage of a situation. And I don't know whether that's bad or good. Um, it feels kind of bad to me, but I guess it's not like I'm going to starve to death. Please buy my Power Rangers Zeo figures. Um, but you know what I'm trying to say. I so, know exactly what you mean. So anyway, moving on to my next story. This one I'm actually kind of looking forward to. I just don't know how they're going to pull it off. So Disney Plus, according to ComingSoon.net, is remaking Robin Hood with Carlos Lopez Estrada uh, directing. So according to Deadline, Disney Plus is developing a live-action CG hybrid remake of Robin Hood with Carlos Lopez Estrada, uh, who also directed Blind Spotting Legion High and Mighty, set to direct from a screenplay from Carl Granlund, who also wrote Lady and the Tramp, Troubleshooters, and Godmothered. Uh, this will be a remake of the 1973 animated classic, which was a musical comedy that featured anthropomorphic animals in the role of Robin Hood characters. The movie was directed by Wolfgang Reitherman from a story by Larry Clemens, along with story sequences by blah, 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 blah. Um, the animated Robin Hood starred Roger Miller, Peter Ustev, Terry Thomas, Brian Bedford, Monica Evans, and Phil Harris. This is one of the first Disney movies I remember seeing as a kid, and Me I too. loved it. I, I liked it. I haven't seen it in years. I remember seeing. I'm actually going to rewatch it soon. Uh, my grandpa had had taped for me uh, a bunch of movies he had on VHS, but this is one that he put back to back with. Uh, it was that and Sword in the Stone 
on a beta cassette because that's what our family had when I was little was beta. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I would go, you know, over to my grandpa's <coughs> and he would have, here's some Disney movies that were, you know, aired on the Disney channel and he would tape it off TV and put it for me because uh, he was one of those guys that had like all the cable channels and he had like satellite and stuff that, you know, you could get channels we couldn't get normally. So I had a collection of all these years ago. I've never seen it on DVD. Uh, like I know it exists, obviously. I know it's on Blu-ray, but I've, I've only ever seen it on Betamax. Um, I think this is a more interesting approach because I was surprised when they did Lady and the Tramp. One, I think they should redo at some point. Um, I'd like to see the Aristocrats remade because I just think that'd be uh, interesting. You mean Aristocrats. Oh, Aristocrats is a very cats, different, right. very different Sorry. joke. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, right. <laughs> The Gilbert Gottfried one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it involves a lot more fluids. <laughs> I would like to see Oliver and Company because that movie had a wonderful soundtrack and that sad kitten sequence just makes me really angry um, and sad at the same time as it makes you ball like a bitch. Um, Every single time. How could they do that to a kitty? Um, bastards. Um, he just wants love. Exactly. How can you not fucking love the little kitten? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this will be cool when it actually happens. And Disney can turn these around relatively quickly. So hopefully in the next like two years. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, sorry, my voice is just going to catch me here. This story comes in. If you've been watching the news anytime in the last two years, I'm certainly you've heard of pharma bro, Martin Scarelli, and he got arrested last year for a multitude of crimes. And he's currently serving, I think a three or four year prison sentence, maybe a little bit longer, but he is asking for a three month furlough, supposedly to help coronavirus. So, uh, sure. this one, Yes, <laughs> like he's not a flight risk. So this or that one, he's not, or that he's not going to buy up some patent and make it so that you have to pay like a thousand dollars to get your vaccine. Yeah, like this is the guy. For a little bit of background, he jacked up the price of an H uh, of an HIV drug to several hundred times or several times its cost. So it was basically priced out. Um, he also, uh, is in, in jail right now for securities fraud. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to read the story one once again, coming courtesy of Gizmodo. <coughs> Excuse me. Martin Scurley. <laughs> oh, <the> pharma- <laughs> yeah, that's how much I think of this guy. So Martin Scurley, the pharmaceutical executive impossible goblin kobold hybrid best known for acquiring the rights and jacking up the price of hiv drug uh Darifrim has uh before scoring seven years in a cell for securities fraud is trying to get out of prison for claiming he might be able he might be of use in the fight against no- novel coronavirus uh per stat scarelli has requested a three-month furlough claiming that his experience in the pharmaceutical industry qualifies him the search for treatments for COVID-19, the disease caused by the SARS-CoV-12, or sorry, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. In a science paper written alongside two business partners and two citizen scientists, Shkreli claimed to be one, one only one of the pharma execs capable of overseeing all aspects of drug development. As a successful two-time biofarm entrepreneur, having purchased multiple companies, invented multiple new drug candidates, filed numerous INDs and clinical trial applications. I am one of the few executives experienced in all aspects of drug development from molecule creation and hypothesis generation to preclinical assessments and clinical trial design and target engagement, demonstration and manufacturing synthesis and global logistics for and deployment of medicines. Scarelli further claimed that he had not been paid to participate in the paper and denied uh, he believed the developers of a COVID-19 treatment should seek to turn a profit on it. The paper itself posits, or whatever, to have used a software technique to whittle down over 100,000 possible treatments for the virus to just nine. According to STAT, though 
Medicinal chemist Derek Lowe told the site, it is not crazy, but neither is it particularly groundbreaking either, at least to my eyes. We're not setting up another Manhattan project and we're not looking for another Robert Oppenheimer either, Lowe told Stapp. But from the tone of his comments, I'm not sure if he realizes either of those points. Scarelli is certainly currently serving time in a U, in USP Allenwood, a maximum security federal prison in Pennsylvania, after being convicted of fraud for ripping off investors and two hedge funds and lying about one of his companies to inflate its stock price. The charges weren't re- related to this decision to jack up the price of Darifrim by 5,000%. The Supreme Court has refused to hear his appeal in the case. Um, yeah. so yeah, this guy's just trying to get out of jail and run. However, that being said, there are certain states and even places up here in Canada where they're letting certain prisoners out of jail early because of coronavirus, because there are prison populations are highly at risk. I know in, in the United States, Rikers Island is considered particularly susceptible. And I think there's cases already in the population. If I remember right, um, in New York, my heart goes out to you because you are in some bad shape. Um, yeah. something I saw the <laughs> other day, I saw drone footage and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I really hope I'm wrong. Um, but it was of a mass grave because they don't have time it, to bury It wouldn't people. surprise me. Um, again, I saw this from a source that I trust, but... It's not good out there. And I, and I know we've set, promised to stay away from the coronavirus news as much as we could. So we're going to drop that story and give something a little bit nicer to finish out our two news. We have two stories that should hopefully make things a little bit happier. So if you remember uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, here on the show, we played the Cambridge Chronicles with uh, Terrible Warriors, and we ran um, a Marvel one shot, which what did I call it? I um, am totally drawn a blank on what you called it. It was Avengers um, Final Conflict or something. I don't know. Either yeah, way, we'll, have to, we'll have to look it up. It's been a while. Yeah, either way, the point I bring that up is we use an old system. And I'm talking one of the first licensed role-playing games that was done by TSR, the same company that did Dungeons & Dragons. But they licensed out a system, from, or Marvel licensed their IP to TSR, and we got Marvel Heroic Role-Playing. Or sorry, Marvel Superheroes. Marvel Heroic Role-Playing is the Cortex system. It's different. So comic creators and more will play TSR's Marvel superheroes live online to raise funds for comic book retailers who've been hit hard, particularly by this virus, because if the comic book store is not open, you can't get your comic book order. I have a friend of mine who's getting hit by this very, very hard because diamond, the company in charge of 90% of comic distribution is saying, well, we're not shipping stuff to you and we're not going to pay people either. So So anyway, according to Newsarama.com, a group of comic creators, animation actors, and RPG creators are banding together to raise funds for comic book retailers playing the cult favorite TSR game Marvel Super Heroes. Writers David Gallagher, uh, Jackson Lansing, and more will be playing the game live on Twitch.tv April 16th, beginning at 8 p.m. EST, looking for fan donations that will be forwarded to the comic book industry charitable fund or the bnic um some of the people there it's kind of hard to read from the the article just because i can't see who some of these people are because the artwork they got is particularly low res (laughs) now there's a pop-up on my thing and i can't get fucking rid of it Um, And and this is what's destroying the internet yeah one of the people they got is a person who worked on um the witcher um I guess he's a family of race, I think it says. Daniel R. Faust, uh, who wrote Kung Fury. Um, or sorry, Kung Fu Enter. I can't remember. What, I can't read it. This graphic is so low res, unfortunately. But the fact that they are doing something for the comic book industry that has been hit by this virus, because that's something that a lot of people don't realize, because comic books do eat up your time, which is great but there is a logistical supply chain there. So there's the distributor, which in this case is mostly diamond for like every comic book shop. Um, 
And if they can't get product, they can't sell it to you. Now, some comic book shops are still are still offering curbside pickup if you want to get like back issues or something like that, or they're offering grab bags. My friend who owns the comic book store in Orangeville is doing like a quarantine special, like uh, 20 bucks. Here's the latest run of whatever, plus a trade paperback. Just pay 20 bucks plus shipping and it'll be out tomorrow. And that's one way comic book places are surviving. Also, comic book stores are surviving by selling board games, role-playing games, again, by curbside pickup only or by appointment only um, because most places have ordered non-essential businesses to shut down. So that's cool. Um, I know this has also hit the RPG industry particularly hard um, because certain uh, distributors are withholding payments because it's affecting their bottom line. They're like, yeah, that's great. We're not going to pay you right now. And that screams to me of highly illegal or at least highly unethical, um, which is unfortunate because some RPG um, companies may not survive this. Several which is very comic, true. Um, which is really unfortunate. Um, several comic book uh, people have stepped up to the plate saying they're going to do their best to help out individual uh, retailers. I think Image, I think, came up and says, I think image which is like mcfarlane i think said something they were they were going to do something they would allow returns from uh diamond or something i don't know I, I you'd have to ask jt from twig sunday funnies he knows all the comic book stuff i'm vaguely oh, aware of it so it's going to be a hard time going forward because they don't want to release too many books digitally because it puts the physical books i don't know it's it's very strange that you can still make your money digitally, but they still want the books printed and on shelves. Cause some of these books have been printed for months. They're just, they haven't been shipped out yet. So they're sitting in a warehouse, but with um, the postal system being kind of a mess right now, like I know there's been talk in the United States that the U S postal service isn't getting help from the federal government right now. So you can't rely on that and not everybody wants to pay like FedEx or UPS to deliver 20 bucks worth worth of comics to your door. So, yeah, which is funny because it's very different from up here. Like one of the things, the one of the first things they said is that no matter what Canada post will run. <laughs> so like it, it, as somebody who has mailed things back and forth to the States, uh, it's taking like one day to get to the border and then things are staying stuck in the states while because they're running on like reduced customs people. Yeah. So and, and yet something that you order from the states to come to Canada, you know, it takes it's, it's fairly you know, quick. It takes like three or four days to get to the border, one day to do uh, the customs, and then it's here. Like yeah, it's, it's, fun, uh, it's funny how our our postal system uses a tenth of of the uh, employees as the American one does, and it's still running at peak efficiency during all this yeah yeah it's weird because just before everything went to shit so about the end of march my friend jen or jen f friend of the show sent me a package she sent it to me on tuesday of that week i had it by friday i was like whoa yep. and yet vice versa if you if you had shipped it down to the states for whatever reason they're holding things up it'll take like two weeks minimum yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's so strange. Stuff coming to Canada usually takes about a week, maybe a week and a half. But whenever you send something to the States, it always gets held up or it gets lost. I sent mail to my friends um, who work at WMMR and they never get it. Now, I don't know whether that's the fault of the U.S. postal system or the mail room at, at the radio station. Possibly. But, but still, eh. anyway, final final good news story, I would say. This one comes courtesy of JoeBlow.com. So CBS is doing their part while we quarantine by bringing back an old staple of its programming lineup to give us more to watch while we self-isolate. The network has announced the return of its Sunday movie tradition, which was a mainstay for years up until about 15 years ago. CBS will air a series of classic blockbuster titles produced by Paramount Pictures every Sunday throughout the month of May, beginning with the Steven Spielberg classic Raiders of the Lost Ark. Sunday at the movies will also 
include other fan favorites such as Forrest Gump, Mission Impossible, Titanic, and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Funny how they won't do Temple of Doom. Um, because everybody just forgets about that heart ripping scene. Kalima. <laughs> you know, it's so good. I, television stations are going to have to get creative. I noticed one new show that's coming back and I don't know how they're filming it because television production is essentially shut down everywhere. Um, Jimmy Kimmel is doing who wants to be a millionaire, but it's like, there's no audience. I don't even know how they get contestants for that. Um, I've seen like the promo air like a bunch of times, but God knows Um, certain shows have ended prematurely as their season finale. One example, and I hate to use it was Grey's anatomy ended on its on ended its season early and it should have had like four more episodes because typically season finales air last week of April, first week of May. So the shows that I watch, the Goldbergs and School, they'll th- their season finales will be coming up really soon. Uh, and and other shows were I know, uh, like Law and Order was cut short from twenty two or twenty three episodes to twenty. A lot of them are were scrambling to try to edit things. There are some shows that just sort of ended abruptly. Yeah, like I know there's up later. Yeah, like there's certain shows we may not see them come back for like a year and change now. Um. Like this summer movie or not summer hell this summer entertainment slate is going to be really goddamn bleak. Nope. Uh, because all the summer stuff was produced last year. So it's all the fall shows that are going to be really hurt hard. Cause now would be when they're producing episodes. Yeah. Like I, I don't know how things I've are going to look. I've been using uh Quibi. That is the new uh, app for your phone. You should download it. Um, I've heard it shit. Uh, no, the shows are good. <laughs> uh, like they have like real actors doing good. Like one of the Hemsworths is in it. Uh, what they're doing is making like it's been ten done minute before. shows. Ten minutes. It's not really ten minute shows though. They're basically movies. They're like two hour movies that are then cut into ten minute parts. Yeah, I, I, I've been doing some research in the Quibi. Um, they were basically, for those of you folks that don't know, this was a company that had a Super Bowl ad this year, has had over a billion dollars invested in it. If you're a, it's, it's Jeffrey if, Katzenberger. He when, once he left DreamWorks, this is what he founded. Yes, and um, he did give a year of the service to um, team T-Mobile customers. The response to Quibi has been less than impressive, however. Um, it has less than 300,000 downloads. People, Some people are taking advantage of the five, $5 for 90 days or something like that. It's, in Canada, it's free for 90 days. Yes. Um, so, And it's uh, was it $6.99 if you uh, want to pay monthly after that, or $9.99 if you want to pay for ad-free versions. I'm going to use the three months and then be done with it. And then if a show comes out or a movie comes out, I really want to see, then I'll pay for it. Well, it's weird because Quibi for having money on a Super Bowl ad, they also did a tie in the Fortnite. You could watch the new version of punk at the Fortnite drive-in, but there was no advertising for it. Like I didn't even know about it until the day of they're like, Oh, by the way, but I think you're going to see more stations air classic programming because all these stations have access to huge libraries hell if abc for example wants to be the good guys here abc is owned by disney right they could do a marvel movie marathon every single night until the end of time because i'm trying to think because right now the last i'm trying to think because at least up here in canada i've seen everything I think everything up to phase two can be aired on broadcast TV. I don't know whether there's been stuff out of phase three yet, but if yeah, they wanted to sure. do the broadcast television premiere of Captain Marvel or Black Panther, they could do that. True. Um, and I think that'd be really good. I mean, if you want people to do that, I think that'd be a really smart idea. I mean, hell, one of the things I'm currently doing and to kind of get me and Alex on the same page and cause Alex is a knowledge of movie trivia, how we're doing our loose cannon show uh, later on this month. Um, it's just watching a movie every day. 
um, Apple or not Apple, ABC and all these other networks, if they are starting to hurt for programming, air a classic movie out of their catalog because they've got it or they have all this classic stuff like, hey, um, they could recreate their programming lineups from like a million years ago and see how it does for like a week. In essence, they can That's play true, with yeah. their scheduling and see they can gather a lot of data here because everybody's at home. Those Nielsen readings or those DVR readings are going to be amazingly accurate right now. Because everybody's eyes are on TV, or the, or everybody's eyes are on are on did, websites. So that's a great time to get. Did you data. see the announcement of um, uh, ATSC, the new version coming out of, of broadcast TV? I'll no. send I'll send you a link, and I, I should we should talk about it later on too. Uh, you know how everything switched? What was it? Was it oh seven when things started to switch over, or was it twenty ten when it was required that everything went digital? I think it was 2010 when it was required. Yeah. Because I remember that. that when the, that's when they shut down, I think, all of the, the old analog stations, except for rural areas. Um, now, and that's what, basically, uh, ATSC went from, uh, went to have like a worldwide standard where now everything was uh, broadcast using the same format. So we weren't on PAL or, or NTSC anymore. So what ATSC provided was 1080i maximum, or 720p, uh, but basically 1080i broadcasts with Dolby Digital 5.1 uh, at a slightly lower bandwidth, uh, and it could embed uh, your uh, multi-language subtitles into your thing. That's why you could get, like, if you have an over-the-air antenna like my mom and grandmother have, uh, you can actually get a TV guide thing popping up, even, and it'll tell you what episode of a TV show is airing, even though it's over the air, which is kind of, blow, it blew my mind when that came out. Well, there's a new version being launched. Uh, they're testing it this year. And the idea is, I think, in the next couple of years to have it completely. Um, it, there's a couple of things I'll say quickly here that are not so great. But then the overall product is a million times better than what you could, you know, what you've thought of before. So here's the not so good parts. Um, it will use your, it'll conjunction with an antenna on your roof, use your Wi-Fi in your, play, in your uh, apartment or a building to uh, provide direct ads to you. So what it would mean is like when the commercials pop up, they'll be targeted commercials. So similar to like how YouTube works. Uh, and that's sort of just how it's going to work. But it also means that the ads can be better uh, picked for your demographic. So that's the only downside. But here's the, the big thing, what's going to happen. Uh, it can provide up to 4K HDR streams in Dolby Atmos surround uh and they're going to uh, be able to do this at a lower bandwidth at a stronger signal over longer distances so well now if with an antenna on your roof you might get like six or seven channels you might be able to get 20 or 30 because it's actually going to be broadcasting on multiple bandwidth uh waves so it, it's it's not as complicated as it sounds but it's basically going to open up uh the possibility for a lot more channels but also as you watch any uh, of the new ATSC tuners that are going to come out that you'll be able to buy separately or that will be built into newer TVs moving forward will actually send back data on what you're watching. Basically, it's going to kill the Nielsen system entirely because it'll be like Netflix or YouTube where they can go, oh, he turned it off when young Sheldon came on because he hates that stupid show. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but like it, for the first time ever, they will be able to get worldwide data on what people are actually watching in real time. So Nielsen won't even really need to exist because that's already been a, a system that's kind of, I don't know, I've always felt it was corrupt and certain shows where the data was manipulated to make them sound like they were getting more viewers because their sample size is like 2% <laughs> of but a say, market. But say, yeah, their numbers have always seemed kind of funny to me. I mean, I remember back in college when we used to talk about how radio um data was kind of measured and used i always found that a little bit strange too um but yeah with yeah. television stuff i never really understood it um it just yeah, like, wasn't my my game. yeah it's it's like hollywood accounting it's like how did a movie make 200 million dollars more than its budget but they didn't make enough money to give you your downside check why and yeah you, and then and then you magically get it as long as you are willing to sue them 
you say, I'm going to take you to court to get the rest of my money. And then magically the money shows up that didn't exist. It's that sort of BS. Mm -hmm. So that's going to do it for this edition of the nerd news this week here on this week in geek. Uh, coming up next on the show, we're going to take a look at one of Alex's review from La La Land records. And we're going to take a look at a place that, I hope we eventually get to you someday. And that is Star Trek. And uh, this is a collection of soundtracks from them. Uh, this is the yeah. original series stuff. It's original series. Uh, it's three sets put into a limited collector's box that you can buy from their website. It's 15 CDs, 16 hours of music. <laughs> Ooh. It's pretty crazy. Uh, and it's worth listening to uh, the review there. Uh, but so I guess, yeah, I guess take it away me. Before all the coronavirus stuff happened, uh, I was sent a large box from our friends at La La Land Records uh, to check out just a whole bunch of stuff from their back catalog with some new releases, uh, as well as some stuff to give out for contests, which I will eventually do with uh, This Week in Geek over the summer. We're just waiting till things calm down a little bit. We're trying not to use the mail too much right now, but there's still plenty of stuff to be won over the course of the summer, uh, duplicates of the items we were sent. Uh, so what way to kick off, I guess, the reviews than to go with the uh, special big box that came with accompanying your standard two, three, even sometimes four CD score soundtrack releases. There was the Motherlode, the big release that they have uh, from Star Trek, which is uh, a collection of 15 CDs from the original Star Trek uh, 1966 series. Uh, and each box... Basically, they're divided up into three boxes instead of a large box. Uh, the box sets are divided by season, and then they have different episodes that uh, they correspond to based on the discs and, and what you can fit, because uh, they filled up these 80-minute CDs pretty tight. We're talking, I believe, 16 hours and 10 minutes or so of, of audio. So think about that. That's 16 consecutive hours of movies or TV score, uh, as well as a whole bunch of other you know, uh, sound effects and, and little snippets here and there that you probably have never heard outside of being mixed into the final product back in the 60s, which would have been in mono. But now when Paramount went back and did their massive restoration years ago for the uh, HD releases and they put everything in 7.1 audio, well, they took all those individual tracks and then, you know, now have a completely remastered set that they can work with. So La La Land got the license to release all these, and it's pretty fantastic. So I'll just sort of go over what's included, because it took me a long time. You know, I guess it's 16 hours um, to really appreciate and go through everything that's in here. So you get a, uh, a limited slip box, like a cardboard uh, slip box. These sets are limited to 6,000 total, and they are uh, at a premium. They have an MSRP of about 225. You probably get it for a little less, but not much because these are truly limited collector's editions. Uh, but if you're a Trek fan out there, this is something to track down. Um, but it, what's included is uh, the three sets. There's a big booklet uh, that is, sort of oversees the entire series uh, in that box set. Where it has like pictures and memorabilia and information on the individual episodes of the music. Each of those season sets that are included also have a thick book that goes over in detail uh, where the, the music was used, what it was created for, who composed it. Uh, it's pretty fantastic, actually. They come in one of those uh, standard, remember those multi-jewel cases that were back out in the 90s? Uh, these, they could fit like six, uh, five to six discs in there. Well, they've packed it pretty tight <laughs> to, to get all these discs in. Uh, and luckily, they are those you know heavier-duty Amaray, um, like the good jewel cases that we used to see. So, you know, they're not using a cheap plastic. It's not going to fall apart on you, which is great. Now, in the episodes, uh, they would they break them down by episode. Like I said, they include little snippets. Some things can be like you know, one minute long that would be played in the loop in the background. Some things are longer composed pieces. Some things are extended beyond what we would have heard in the actual episodes. But of course, they include the main titles. They include multiple versions of the main opening and closing titles, uh, even demos, alternate takes of each of them. So some you know they might have composed and produced 
two or three versions, and then that's what they chose was the the final product. Uh, it even has the singer version where you know somebody is is singing along with the Star Trek. Not that there's lyrics, but you know the the da 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 da, da all that stuff. So uh, that's pretty neat. Now they also include things like uh, closing credits with like where you'd have like an incidental snippet version that was used for syndication. Uh, pretty neat uh, overall stuff. They even have uh, the music that was used when they were pitching the trailer or pitching the original uh, Man Trap pilot, which is kind of neat. Overall, uh, everything is, uh, parts of it are in mono, parts of it are in stereo, depending on what was recorded and what was re- restored. And, and it's it's nice to have sort of a, a mix of both. But everything is crystal clear, uh, restored with the highest quality of dynamic range you can get. Very little hiss, surprisingly, since this show is, you know, going on nearly 60 years now. So it's pretty fantastic. Uh, there is just a daily, just so much to go through. Some of the best things in here were uh, little gimmicky things that they would put in. Like, just, here's like background music that would play when, when certain sound effects were normally going off. So it's pretty cool that way. Uh, each of the discs is structured similarly in that... Season one, we'll have the season one opening theme at the beginning and the closing theme at the end of all the, the tracks and so on and so forth. And it, it's overall just a, a, like I've never seen a set come with this many tracks uh, to give you an idea. Like I said, some are longer, some are shorter, but there are uh, a total of let me see here. There are a total because I, I had to write it down. I'm on a list here. Uh, there are 560 tracks amongst the 15 CDs. So there is everything you can imagine included in here. And if you're a big sci-fi fan, it's probably worth it for you. Uh, if you're somebody like myself, when I was a kid, we used to make like homemade uh, you know, camcorder videos of us pretending to be in, in Star Trek. You know, we're going to recreate the Gorn scene and all this. This is where you would get like if you want a backing track to your home videos and to play in the background, this is the CD set to have because it has everything you could imagine, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's not going to be obviously for the casual or for the even like the regular normal fan. It's got to be for somebody who really is super appreciative of soundtracks and, and loves to have that sort of thing. Or if you're a huge Trekkie and you just want to flesh out your collection because it is so much music packed into a, into like such a small set that it's it's completely goes above and beyond anything that I think CBS Paramount would have released on their own. you qualified to be a reporter i'm willing to violate anyone's privacy for my personal gain and then claim with a straight face that the public has a right to know by the hand of zeus what manner of deviltry is this i love fake alien poop day and welcome back to twig otherwise known as the flagship of stupidity i'm mike the birdman dodd he's alex the producer let's talk about poop shall we here on the weird wacky and the strange things that just happened on the planet this week oh take that out of context let's talk about poop because that's where we're going to start this week. So this uh, our article comes courtesy of interestingengineering.com. 
Toilets are a part of our lives, and we don't think about that very often. While some nations, particularly Japan, have upgraded their restroom visits to the next level with heating seats and comforting background noises, the rest of us are content with our sit, flush, and leave policy regarding toilets. Now, an ambitious team of researchers has designed a fully automated sensor package that can put your normal toilet and turn it into a Sherlock Holmes of toilets. The smart toilet is a self-contained system that operates autonomously by leveraging pressure and motion sensors. Um, once the sensor package is mounted on a conventional sit-down toilet, it monitors your health by checking your poop and urine for factors such as consistency, glucose, and red blood cell count and color. The device can detect conditions such as chronic constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, prostate cancer, kidney failure, and it could could be of especially use uh, to individuals who are genetically predisposed. Predisposed. Whatever. Predis- predispositioned. <laughs> predispositioned. My, there we Mike, go. Michael broke for a second. His record was uh, yeah, I, That's all. <laughs> I malfunctioned. The certain you, you, you are an 80s child, so you're on vinyl. So that's what happened. Uh, one of the scientists, uh, I can't, I think his name is Sanjev uh, Gambier, professor, uh, professor and chair of radiology at Stanford University, and who is the man behind the project, says, our concept dates back to well over 15 years. When I'd bring it up, people would sort of laugh because it seemed like an interesting idea, but also a bit odd. Here's a closer look at the monitoring system, how it is used to check. It's weird, this diagram. You know, the thinking man, the guy with his with his head on his wrist sort of thing. It's got him sitting on the toilet. He's pooping. There's like a pressure sensor, but there's all these other sensors that there's a small camera that can scan your butthole. Um, And he says, we know it seems weird, but as it turns out, your anal print is unique. Therefore it can be used as a recognition system to match users to their specific data. So if multiple people in a household share a toilet, it's not going to get the, data confused you might want to zoom in at the image at the top for a detailed look at how an imaging uh scanned by the camera exactly looks like we advise that you shouldn't though um if you're interested in implementing the smart toilet into your daily life in the future you must make peace with the fact that you'll be hearing you'll be bearing it all to the camera that scans your anus to get an anal print for science purposes the toilet automatically sends data extracted and analyzed from any samples to a secure cloud-based system According to researchers, the system could be integrated in the hospitals for record-keeping systems for quick and easy access. The project is still in its early stages, and the researchers are not aiming at replacing a doctor or a diagnosis. It would just alert users in case of any red flags could warrant medical attention. Um, This could be really useful, particularly people. um, Let's look at at like us, for example, because we're in the gastric uh, bypass program. You're potentially going for a second surgery. I'm going for my first. This could detect bleeds um, from your intestinal tract because it would show up in your in your stool samples. Um, If you have low iron, it could potentially detect something like that, though that's more of a blood test. Consistency, it's it's a gross thing to talk about, but my sister-in-law, who's a nurse practitioner, there's a scale you can use. I forget what it's called, but as a scale of poop from like one to five, I think it is one is super hard. It's all I really need to tell you about super hard. And five is liquid. Um, And basically depending on where your, where your poop is on the scale, it's color and consistency will tell you, is there too much fat in your diet? Is it too much grease? Is you is there blood? Stuff like that. And that can tell you a variety of different health things. So this is kind of neat. Although I think I remember hearing about the story from a different uh, outlet. And I think they said there's only 300 of these smart toilet seats currently working. So the sample size is fairly small right now. But I do think it's it's potentially interesting um, as this could be used for people who suffer from chronic conditions. If like For somebody like myself who has IBS, I don't need a toilet seat to fucking tell me that. Believe me, I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everybody in the building knows. Um, oh, God, please move. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, this for use in hospital wards – like particularly if the patient is able to get out of their bed and go to the bathroom and not using like a bedpan, if this could be synced to their room data and have regular updates sent to 
the nurse on duty who's the charge nurse and that would update the doctor at the end of the day because having rates of your bowel movements that's something doctors and nurses do keep keep track of at least when whenever i was in the hospital they knew every time i went poop and they were keeping track of it because they were making sure i wasn't bleeding from the inside because since i had my like surgery for my leg they needed to make sure i wasn't developing blood clots or anything like that so it's amazing what poop can tell you about somebody i just never thought in a million years i'd mention on this show an anal print Indeed. <laughs> Your chocolate starfish. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Can I get your autograph, sir? <laughs> Hold on. Let me pull down my pants and spread. Uh, <laughs> I had Taco Bell for lunch. I'm good. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> this st- this story comes courtesy of, of an outlet I bet you never thought you'd ever hear on the show. ESPN. So... We like wrestling. I've been trying to get into football for years. There was a combination this year known as the XFL, and it was supposed to be tremendous. Vince McMahon's like, put more money into it. And, well, the XFL has suspended operation, lays off employees, and has no plans for the 2021 season. So the XFL suspended operations Friday morning, and multiple sources told ESPN that the league has laid off nearly all its staff, a handful of executives remain employed, and currently has no plans to return in 2021. The XFL is owned by WWE CEO and President Vince McMahon and Alpha Entertainment. In a statement, WWE said, given the uncertainty of the current environment, the the XFL has suspended operations and is evaluating its next steps. The XFL canceled its season last last month after five games as part of a nationwide shutdown due to the coronavirus pandemic, pledging to return next year. But XFL COO Jeffrey Pollack changed course Friday, conducting a 10-minute conference call to inform employees of the news. Commissioner Oliver Luck, hired in 2018 to guide the most ambitious spring football league in decades, did not speak on the call. It was not immediately clear if he was still with the league. According to a prominent former XFL staffer who was on the call, Pollock stopped short of saying the league was going out of business, but the strong implication was clear. It's done. The staffer said it's not coming back. There is no immediate comment from the league. St. Louis uh, Battlehawks receiver LaDamian, I think his name is, Washington, was among those reacting to the league's decision on social media. He says in his in his tweet, quote, rip at XFL 2020, gone but never forgotten. Another person uh, was quoted as saying, PJ Walker, before you get one win, you got to take a thousand losses. McMahon was making his second foray into professional football. His rowdy 2001 version of the XFL was also folded after one year. McMahon pivoted 180 degrees for XFL 2.0, asking Luck to create a serious football league that would market a new version of the game while avoiding direct competition with the NFL. Luck led a group of staffers through two years of product development, establishing a series of innovations from its new kickoff alignment to a three-tiered extra point structure that caught the eye of multiple members of the XFL competition committee. XFL staffers believed the league would resume play in 2021. Players had previously been told they would be paid through the end of the regular season, which was scheduled to end this weekend. The XFL is the second spring football league in as many years to suspend operations before completing its first and final season. I'll bet for much different reasons. The Alliance of American Football ran out of money in 2019 and closed after eight weeks of play. The XFL might be the first pro sports league to fall victim to the economic crisis caused by the global pandemic. Let's be um, honest, it wasn't going to last anyway. I watched a couple games and I was like, really? Yeah. What was it like? Um, I First of all, I could not find where they were airing in Canada. <clears throat> so I'm not I, surprised. <clears throat> so I had to watch somebody else's like DVR copy of it. Um, and they're like, I actually was, I went on Reddit and I'm like, does anybody have this? And they're like, here, Canada, <laughs> <laughs> here, Canada boy. And I watched them like, cool. I get it. It is, it was faster paced. It was very well produced. You know what it looked like though? It what? didn't look as high budget as NFL. It looked like CFL. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, cool. But here's a question: Did they need the XFL to exist? See, I don't see why Vince had such a hard on for it. I mean, he doesn't the, like to fail; refuses to believe it. Now he's failed harder than he did the first time. 
it aired like what three games <laughs> four games or something like that and it's over not many i th- i think less than six i want to say five games total um a couple of people that i follow on twitter went to a couple games in la i think um for whatever their team was called and i was interested in the xfl if it lasted till next year i'm thinking all right maybe i'll check it out um but it seems like it was a really short season to begin with i think the the nfl is really short too so i don't know what do i know i know literally nothing about football um but this has potential to be interesting to me um just because it is a wwe branded product i figure well if their wrestling sucks maybe their football won't be so bad and turns out it was terrible too um so unfortunate for all the players and people that are going to be affected by this because it's not just like people that are the production staff people who edit videos not just frontline staffers but also people who worked the arenas who provided concessions parking attendants it ripples so yay vince doesn't get to vacation in the hamptons this year but other people are going to be out of work for a lot longer so that's unfortunate to them so Moving on to our last story, and we kind of talked about this last week uh, indirectly. Um, So according to TheGuardian.com, sex toy sales have tripled during New Zealand's coronavirus lockdown. Speculation uh, is rife with, with an impending baby boom, but experts say uncertain times mean this is unlikely. So, um... Wow, I was going to read all this more, but it uh, turns out I just got paywalled because it's being stupid. Oh, here Indeed. we go. Got, <laughs> got rid of it. They said they were warned by the officials against stockpiling toilet paper or flour, but that's not all New Zealanders have been hoarding. According to the nation's largest, largest retailer of sex toys, which has said sales of its products tripled after Jacinda Arden announced a month-long lockdown of the country, New Zealanders are permitted to leave their homes only to access essential services, such as to take walks during the national shutdown, which began a fortnight ago and will remain in place for at least a further two weeks. The measures generated mirth on social media about a possible baby boom nine months after the stay at home rules lifted and worried about family planning specialists has access to various forms of birth control dwindled. The restrictions also plumb prompted a tripling of sex, tail, sex toy sales in the 48 hours before the lockdown was imposed on 20, on the 25th of March. And the prospect of a boring month indoors seemed to have prompted New Zealanders to stash adult products like they might have never tried before, said adult toy megastore, uh, New Zealand-based uh, company. We're selling lots of beginner toys. All our beginner rangers are very popular, it says uh, Emily Wright, a spokesperson for the business. It definitely looks like people are saying, I got time. I might try something new. Sales of condoms, lubricant, and menstrual cups are among other purchases that spiked after the Arden uh, announced a lockdown, as well as adult board games and perhaps reflecting a wider trend towards disinfecting behavior, sex toy cleaner. Um, Adult toy megastore told The Guardian it had experienced a number of significant sales boosts in recent weeks, all coinciding with the major news announcement about the COVID-19 pandemic in New Zealand, Australia, and Britain. Purchases tripled in all three countries, and on the day the World Health Organization declared the, corona, declared the coronavirus a pandemic on the 11th of March. Sales for the site doubled in Australia on the 22nd of March, which Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced bars would close in Britain uh, on the 21st of March when Boris Johnson announced the same. Looking at what people were buying at that point, it was all sex toys, said, said Emily. It was like they were thinking, we can't go to bars, we can't pick it up, we can't go out on dates. Adult Toy Megastore was deemed an essential service by New Zealand's government and was allowed to continue operating during the shutdown because it sells condoms and medical items. All staff are working from home. While hundreds of social media posts have been devoted to naming the generation of children following the pandemic, popular choices include uh, coronials, the quarantines or baby zoomers named after the video conferencing application zoom analysts said a baby boom nine months after the lockdown was unlikely despite new zealand's new zealanders apparent boredom uncertainties like this tend to see delayed fertility because people feel uncertain about the world they're going to be bringing a child into said paul spoonley a distinguished professor of um demigree or a professor of demigorgon (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, demigorgon. I've never seen that word before uh, uh, at Massey University. Those thinking that starting a family will probably put off that decision, I think the urge to delay will be stronger than the inclination to become pregnant even by mistake. Couples who did not already live together have been separated by the lockdown, he added, and the opportunities for casual sex have, quote, evaporated after the shutdown. The country's economic woes would also dissuade many from having children, Spoon, he said. Um, and it goes on like this for quite some time. Um, I'm not surprised. Um, I know we talked about uh, other sex stories spiking. I think it was like last week or the week before before last. So I find it that funny. Can, that, that in Canada, it spikes more than anywhere else. Yeah, I'm not really surprised. We're a horny people and it gets cold. Um, and I mean, ultimately, it's the safest sex is with yourself. I mean, as long as you're cleaning and disinfecting your toys afterwards, which you should be doing, that's just good practice. And that that's just clean cleanly. Um, you should be fine. And it's, it's funny. There was a story. I don't know whether I talked about it here on the show, but because there is medical fetishes, like people who dress up as doctors and nurses, some of these sex toy stores have been donating their extra N95 masks or hospital gowns to hospitals. I know that happened in Britain uh, about a week or two ago. So maybe this adult toy mega store is donating any of their fetish stuff to local hospitals. That's a possibility as well. Um, so thank those who have a kink, I guess. Um, a lot of people going to be trying something new. I actually said this to a friend of mine, um, a little while ago. And I think I said this on last week's show, this is going to be a boom for the adult industry, particularly for performers who are their own, um, camera person, yeah. producer. Uh, you know what else? Not just that even old school, traditional phone sex. Uh, yeah, there are going to be people that just want to make that connection. You know, absolutely. Um, I got friends of mine who work in the, adult industry and i follow them on twitter and one of the things i read from one of the girls tweets she said sometimes sexting is more than just talking sexy sometimes it's about feeling a genuine connection and she posted a screenshot a part of the conversation she had with this guy with this person's permission of course and it went something along the lines of sometimes i just want to feel wanted and i just want to feel heard and being apart from my family and all my friends right now, I really needed this. Thank you. Here's your tip in addition to what services you've already uh, provided. So sex workers are feeling this too, because they are performing an essential service right now. Like literally it's not just phone sex, it's cam sessions. It's generating solo content. You know, it's, it's going to sound hokey and, and people will, some prudes will sno scoff at it. In some cases, this is the only form of therapy that people can afford. If that makes any sense. Like, they're, Absolutely. Like, like, especially when it's like you're on the hour, it's like, Oh, you're paying 50 or a hundred dollars an hour to speak to a therapist. Well, you can't even do that in person right now. And there are options online, obviously, but it was a better help. I think is, is the, one of the ones out there was a better help or better health. One of those, uh, where you can get cheaper rates, especially in the States. But in some ways for some people, this is their therapy. If it makes yeah. any sense. Yeah. I mean, it's a genuine human connection. And while sex workers are not trained therapists, they are an ear and they are paying to listen to you. And sometimes if you don't have that connection with friends or family and you just want to feel heard or feel intimacy, even on a different level, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, we're in, in 2020, we should be destigmatizing de sex work anyway. They're they work just as hard as you do. Yeah, there, there's deep-rooted uh, issues people have. Prejudice. Well, pre no, prejudice and then also religious beliefs can be affecting it. Um, but I think with the – it happened a bit with the, the Gen Xers, but with the millennials, um, we relaxed that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I think significantly more so with the Gen Z kids, the ones that are post-2000. Well, yeah, because you see a lot of those – people have started up sites on like 
OnlyFans, Chatterbait, Live Camp, Pornhub, and, and it's and they actually view it. It's not even like it's weird. Instead of not weird, isn't they're weird. I'm saying the weird situation. It's gone from being um, something where a sex worker or a chat person was that's their job, that's their persona, that's the and they presented essentially like this is my porn persona. It's now been so integrated into blogging life and, and and online life that it's more so that like it's just they're okay with being themselves. <clears throat> you know, they're not presenting a, a fake imaginary version of themselves. They're prevent, uh, presenting themselves, and it's almost viewed as like busking. You know what I mean? It's almost like it's like almost like a street performer. Well, like, yeah, I mean, you know, they're, it's, it's, they're it's just like, it's another a, kind it, of performer. It, it's like, hey, I'm an accountant by day, but for fun at night to get extra money, I I, I do cam stuff. Yeah, I mean, and, honestly, and, there's and, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but it's, it's funny. It's taken basically a generational leap in forward into being accepted, not just as like, not as like, uh, oh my God, it's so taboo, but I mean like to the point where they can actually live themselves like they don't have to pretend to be somebody else yeah absolutely and, i'm and and the casual like casually they can enter the, the industry now mm-hmm. and there's less of a stigma following you if you choose to go into a different career yes there are still some traditional career yeah. paths that may there, be hampered by you're your you're past. gonna have a hard time uh getting a job working with children still um yes. like, like uh as like you wouldn't be able to work in daycare, you wouldn't be able to work as a teacher. It's it's uh, a lot of there's a lot of morality clauses still in a lot of these uh, old school businesses, mm-hmm. uh, but there's nothing that says it's like I'm an accountant for a firm or I'm uh, you could even be you know a female or male programmer who works for a company and then just for fun on the side my side business is I am X online. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's I mean I think it it's a great side hustle. It's if you want to do adult work, it's safe because you choose who you work with, how you do it. Yeah. And you know what it is? if you it's, do it's the uberfication of it. It's like Uber drivers, but porn. Yeah. I mean, the only thing is if you are doing this, and this goes for anybody who's entering the business professionally, and <clears throat> make sure you do your research, make sure you are tested and you are clean if you do decide to work with yeah. other people. Um, there and are remember, adult testing services. And remember, it is forever. The yes. second you put a single image on, it's forever. So do so knowing what the risk is, but also do so because that is your choice and you are free to do so. Because we here are very liberal minded in our thinking. Your body's your own fucking business. Just because we um, wouldn't do it ourselves doesn't mean we think you should have you should be judged for doing it. Yeah, I mean, right now, um, some of my people who work in the adult industry, I've they've asked me for my advice, and I'm thinking, well, here's what I would do given your situation, and I'm glad to be of help to them, just the fact that they feel comfortable in their sexuality to do that. I think it's a very positive thing, and I think it's a very positive message that they can take forward. They should not be ashamed of doing what they want. And they should not feel shame for doing anything. So as long as you're being safe out there, folks, that's the big takeaway from all this. Um, I imagine there's going to be Corona babies or other things at at, at some point. <laughs> you make it sound like the Harlequin babies, <laughs> which don't well, look that up. A... Don't look that up ever. No, no. Alex did that for me once and it was terrifying. So anyway, that's what we got for our last bit of here uh, stories here on the nerd news network for the weird section. Uh, But before we check out of this week's show, we have one final review from Alex looking at yet another selection of soundtracks. This one comes to us from Die Hard, one of my favorite movies of all time. So this is Alex's review from La La Land Records. This is Die Hard. I'm having a quick look at La La Land Records' release of Die Hard, music composed and conducted by Michael Kamen, the 30th anniversary remastered edition uh, score on CD. It's actually a three-disc set, comes in one of those thick uh, jewel cases for, that you remember from back in the 90s, with a very large internal booklet that goes over every individual track, 
where it was positioned in the movie, how it was uh, created, uh, who was on it, why, and so forth. Uh, it's actually a really good read as you're listening to it. So it's broken down into three sections. You have uh, the film score, which has a total runtime of about 70 minutes. Uh, the film score continued, uh, which uh, and some additional music as well, which has a runtime of 72 minutes and is there to sort of accompany uh, things, there's little fillers here and there. And then there is a third disc called The Vault, bonus music from Die Hard. Now that's probably the one that's going to be the most interesting to uh, big fans that you know would not have been able to hear anything like this before because that stuff's never been released prior to this, uh, this set coming out. Now, uh, it, it's not going to be, you know, it's a score, so it's not going to have any music that say that w- would have been incidentally playing in the background. But remember, this is a movie that was based around having just a fantastic action score, and it's sort of the almost prototype for every 90s movie that came out later on. Now, the booklet that it comes with, like I said, has a lot of information on all of the uh, uh, the extra incidental uh, tracks. And the third disc, uh, the bonus disc, is a little different. Uh, it, it has... It's interesting. They've gone literally into the vaults of different people's collections that, that worked in the film to grab snippets and demos and, and uh, just a whole bunch of ephemera that is involved with this. So you might get like just the horns or just the, the strings or the tension parts. It's interesting that they, they go ahead and do stuff like that. Uh, it's pretty cool. And it's actually a fairly reasonable set uh, price-wise. It's going to fluctuate out there. Uh, but I'll put a link to La La Land's website so where you can check it out. I know Birdman is super hyped about this. So uh, when I get a chance to actually see him and we're not uh, socially isolating, <laughs> he's going to definitely have to check this out and listen to it because it is one of the best action sc- uh, scores out there. Uh, and for the first time ever, it's available uh, you know, in a three-disc set that uh, sounds fantastic. A lot of stuff from the 80s has a bit has like tape hiss. Not this. This was preserved quite well, and it makes sense because this is the kind of movie that has been released, you know, in nauseam over and over and over again, uh, you know, on video. So they've had a chance to clean it up over the years, and it sounds fantastic. It's limited to five thousand units, but you can buy it from them directly, or you can pick it up on Amazon uh, and some music stores will carry it for you as well. Uh, pretty happy with it. I say it's not, you know, it's not going to be uh, a score that. It, it's not like this. It's not like a John Williams score where it's like super, you know, over the top Star Warsy, but it is a really well conducted, great action soundtrack, and it's pretty much stood the test of time, I think. But you have me at a loss. You know my name, but who are you? Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. I really like those sequined shirts. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? yippee ki motherfucker. And that's the kind of show it has been here on ThisWeekInGeek.net. Thank you for joining us once again here on the podcast. We always do love entertaining you as much as we possibly can throughout the week. As you've heard this past week, we had a pretty awesome tour of treasure. It was awesome to be on Alex's show uh, reviewing the Lego um, Star Wars Encyclopedia which I didn't realize how many different characters there really were. Um, plus, we also looked at Ghost Recon um, Deep States for Ghost Recon Breakpoint, which I think is still on sale. So if you can grab that right now with the new realism mode, it's really worth it now. Um, and you reviewed um, the Division 2 on Stadia as well, if I read yeah, correctly. Which, which, to be honest, I couldn't tell much of a difference graphically from the Xbox version. Um, also, the load times so incredibly faster that's Um, also speaking of stadia right now because google is offering stadia pro free for two months right now yeah and i I, one thing that i mentioned in the review that they didn't say is if you've canceled your subscription you can still play your old games uh like like they made it sound like you had because the free free version had not been released officially to the public yet they made it sound like if you weren't subscribing you couldn't play the games you purchased but that wasn't the case. It would drop you to the free account if you've purchased any games. You just can't play the ones that they give to you for free every month. Okay, so well, that's not so it, bad. Yeah, they, they're, they're not the greatest at communicating that because I'm able to play the games at 1080p, no problem. And mm-hmm. at 1080p, 
uh, uses, uses less bandwidth. I'm not seeing really any difference other than I can't do HDR, but I was playing it on my computer monitor and I had no problems. I plugged in the controller, I even used mouse and keyboard. There was like no input lag or anything. Uh, I had a pretty good time. In fact, I think I might play the game more through this because uh, the version they gave me was the ultimate edition that has all the expansions that are going to come out. Yeah, I mean, you're virtually living the early days of the division right now, just not with the dollar bill virus. So thank God for that. Um, Anyway, uh, coming up from us on the site this week, we will be having a future imperfect. We'll be welcoming our friend back, Aaron, as we're going to talk about our favorite sci-fi shows that aren't Star Trek. I myself will be talking about Sliders, if you remember that show from the 1990s, and the 2004 reboot of Battlestar Galactica, a.k.a. one of the closest versions I think will get the Mass Effect for quite some time. Or just gritty space drama. I really liked it. Um, But um, we're going to talk about that and more. Also, I'm interviewing uh, the director behind Never Sleep Again. We actually talked with him many years ago here on the show. But he is also the director behind Crystal Lake Memories, which was the Friday the 13th documentary that had Corey Feldman in it. So we're going to talk just about horror movies in general, um, just the state of horror, and uh, maybe what projects he's got going on. Uh, This weekend, we'll also be recording our... uh, show for twig sunday funnies our first topic on the show is be well i picked this one so no surprise we're going to be talking about power rangers we're going to talk about last year's shattered grid event where lord draken invaded the morphing grid and started stealing morphers from all across all realities and how does it end up for our original five teens with attitude well not as you might think, surprisingly enough. Um, so we'll be talking about that. Uh, me and Alex are still working out some production details since the coronavirus pandemic has kind of changed how we do things here on Twig. So we are working to do Loose Cannon, which is our B-movie show we've been teasing for a couple of weeks now. Um, we are planning on recording our episode uh, either at the end of the month or the first weekend in May. By the way things are sounding, we are working on some Twig After Darks. Um, as soon as social distancing ends, um, we are planning on recording some commentaries. We do have some stuff in store for Halloween type stuff right now. We are working on maybe future recording content. So we have things to drop every weekend in October. So something for you all to look forward to. We're going to talk about some horror franchises that I don't think get nearly enough love because we've talked about Freddy, we've talked about Jason, we've talked about Michael Myers, but nobody talks about Cube or David Cronenberg or the Hellraiser movies, stuff like that, stuff that maybe hasn't gotten the limelight in the in the last couple of years. Cause I know there is talk of a Hellraiser reboot uh, being in production rather soon. So figure what better time like the present to talk about that. Uh, what's coming up from you for Turtle Treasure, Alex? Nothing. <laughs> oh, wow. In that case, uh, uh, we basically, no, no, no. I, it's right now I was focusing on getting final fantasy completed, uh, which will be, we're, we're going to have a prototype on persona five. And then right after that, we're going to have a prototype on final fantasy seven remake. Uh, as far as other things in the works, I'm finally caught up and I'm saying that. And I know within a couple days, it'll be like, Hey, I've got so much crap to do because things <laughs> seem to come in waves right now. Uh, but I, I was able to clear that out. So I, I wanted to clear my slate so that I could actually get to creating um, and revamping Twig After Dark as well as getting uh, some of our other shows ready uh, ready for the slate. Because uh, you'd think that being home um, all the time is, you know, conductive or conducive to getting all these shows done. But then you realize it's, it takes a lot of effort to get that many things off the ground and, and making sure you can juggle everything from everybody involved. Because remember, I've also been... I've been recording and doing all the editing for Mayhem Mics now that it came back too. Yeah, so it's kind of nice for Twig to be firing on all cylinders, plus having JT from Saskatoon join us is pretty nice. Having Blanchard back on the show has also been something special too. So um, it, Yeah, and actually, wait, we have, it's probably coming out the same day that we release um, uh, this episode, but maybe the next day, uh, we do have our WrestleMania special, which is... Uh, yes. Woof. <laughs> What a year this was. That's that's worth a listen, believe me. So anyway, we will be talking about all this and more this week on thisweekingeek.net. So um, hopefully you are all staying safe, be it with your 
multitude of sex toys if you happen to be a Kiwi or a Canadian in this case. Um, as always, folks, please practice social distancing. Wash your hands. Be smart. Listen to lo local and state governments or provincial in our case. Just don't do anything stupid. Hopefully this weekend you've connected with your family via Zoom or via Discord or just FaceTime them or call them. Anyway, just stay in touch with people. I know it's hard, but that's the situation we're in for the foreseeable future. There is light at the end of the tunnel, I assure you. So for Twig on this Easter Sunday, we have been... Alex, the producer. I've been Mike, the bird, mad dots and live for your die hard. And as my friend, Jackie Bam Bam might say, be cool, be kind, be careful. We'll catch you guys next time right here on this week in geek.net. Well, that's our show. All right. Here's the deal. Every time you watch my show, I will send you $40. Checks will not be honored. You've been listening to this week in geek, your source for guaranteed nonsense or your money back. Tune in next week for more info on the most important things you didn't need to know. Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net and subscribe to our podcast through iTunes or any podcatcher. If you'd like to comment on this episode, head over to this episode's post at thisweekingeek.net and leave a comment through Facebook Connect. Follow us on Twitter at thisweekingeek.net and follow our Instagram at twig underscore official underscore podcast. Social media not your thing? Send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. We'll see you next time, and remember... Lower your shields and surrender your listenership. Just when you think this show is terrible, something wonderful happens. What? It ends. <laughs> I have to go. Somewhere there is a crime happening. Wash our hands. Onto our elbows. These are the things, the things we know, we know. If people want to wear a mask... That is okay, these are the things, the things we know to prevent you from speaking moistly, speaking moistly, keep two meters apart, speaking moistly, speaking moistly, keep two meters apart, speaking moistly. I'm not a medical expert. These are the things, the things we know. Keep two meters apart. What I have heard from medical experts. These are the things, the things we know. To prevent you from speaking moistly. Speaking moistly. Keep two meters apart. Speaking moistly, speaking moistly, keep two meters apart, speaking moistly, speaking moistly, keep two meters apart, speaking moistly, speaking moistly, keep two meters apart, speaking moistly. Oh, what a terrible image.